Hello, you beautiful people. Thank you so much for coming back and joining me for Chapter 7 of You Don't Have to Be Evil to Work Here, But It Helps. J.W. Wells and Co. Book 1 by Tom Holt. It's a series of eight books, and I've actually just read the eighth, um, which was the Eight Reindeer of the Apocalypse, over the festive period. But I hope to read all of them in time. If you do enjoy Tom Holt and you haven't subscribed to the podcast, which is the books of Tom Holt, please do. It'd be awesome if you could subscribe to my channel. It really does help it. Maybe give me a little like if you enjoy it and click that notifications bell if you want to hear some more. So I'll start waffling and without further ado, here's chapter seven. Never work, they say, with children or animals a doctrine that Benny Shumway had subscribed to for most of his adult life. Feeding the goats was, however, an exception. It was a pleasantly boring midday chore. Sign out a sack of feed from the stores, lug it down to the cellar, fill the trough, which gave him a welcome opportunity to unwind and let his mind drift into neutral. He looked on it as an antidote to the daily trip to the bank, even though the two tasks were, of course, intimately related. A year or so ago, in order to take advantage of their highly competitive account structures for business customers, JWW had transferred its custom from Barclays to the Bank of the Dead. Accordingly, Benny's daily trip to pay in the cheques, draw the petty cash, arrange for wire transfers and so on, involved him in a trip to the underworld, to which he gained access through a small door in the back hall of his office. In order for the living to contact the dead on their own turf, a blood sacrifice is required, and a detailed cost-efficiency analysis had shown that goats were the most economical option. Once you got used to it, it was no more of a hassle than topping up your mobile, except that you used a Stanley knife instead of a little plastic guard. Nevertheless, Benny couldn't honestly say that he enjoyed his daily outing. The peace and quiet of the gourd cellar was a welcome contrast. Leaning against the manger wall and listening to the soft crunch of feeding ruminants, he could think things over at his own pace, a luxury usually denied him in the frantic rush of the working day. It was hard enough staying on top of his duties as cashier since the demise of that fool Ricky Worm taught her. However, he'd also been filling in as the firm's pest control specialist, since the pests for which J.W.W. generally got called in included dragons, werewolves, manticores, harpies, frost giants, augurs, gins, hydras and all known permutations of the undead, it could at times be a rather demanding portfolio, especially for someone who stood five feet nothing in his socks and whose spectacle lenses were as thick as the bottom of a beer mug. Esmeralda lifted her head and gazed at him, her jaws grinding in their slow, circular rhythm. She had character, Benny reckoned, and since she was the brood nanny, she was safe from the demands of the financial sector. Benny fished in his pocket and took out a small apple. He felt a little like Lord Emsworth, feeding the Empress of Blandings. Cassie's problem, he thought, something of a collector's item. Ever since she'd told him about it, he'd had it constantly in the back of his mind, hanging like game to mature. Definitely, something was going on there. In many ways, it reminded him of examples he'd read about in textbooks long years ago. Identify the catastrophic anomaly of which these are the perceived effects. The particulars didn't fit any of the cases he'd studied. But it had that sort of feel about it. Almost as though someone had made it up to illustrate a specific point. Another good thing about the gourd cellar was that it was a cracking place to hide when he didn't want to be found. According to his watch, at that moment he should have been upstairs, in the interview room, having his assessment. The prospect hadn't bothered him particularly. Who the hell else could they find to do his job for the money? But he reckoned it was one of those things he needed to be in the mood for. And he wasn't. So let them bawl him out or send him a snotty memo. It'd do them good to be mucked about for a change. Meanwhile, He could roost down here for half an hour or so and think about... about what? From the sound of it, though Cassie wouldn't appreciate him saying so, true love seemed like a logical starting point. She described at least half a dozen classic symptoms, that's true, 
The bloke, as she'd described him, sounded like a pathetic wimp. But Benny, who had to stop and think before he could recite the roster of his ex-wives in chronological order, had long since given up on trying to figure out what women see in men. But it wasn't that. He wasn't sure how he knew, but he was quite certain. You could tell when a girl was in love with someone. Small modulations of voice, temper and body language, imperceptible as a dog whistle. And he'd picked up on nothing of the sort. Instead, he kept on coming back to the test papers in the back of Eaton's Theory and Practice of Commercial Sorcery, 27th edition, Manchester, 1906. He could remember the kind of thing as though it were yesterday. A man walking down the street after murdering his grandfather meets an identical copy of himself coming the other way. A practical sorcerer engaged in summoning malevolent spirits in a village on the equator in June discovers that his watch is running backwards. The distance between A and B is exactly 19 miles, but measures 21 miles in a leap year. Explain using diagrams if necessary. Benny smiled. Of course it wasn't politically correct to say sorcerer anymore. He thought of himself yawning his way through night school classes, the new suit he'd bought for the exam. Back then, it had all been so wonderfully straightforward. Working class boy from small mining village wins scholarship, a brilliant career, a partnership. It had all been about improving yourself in those days. Am I improved? He wondered. Or just different? Concentrate. A girl shows all the symptoms of being in love but isn't. Put like that, it could easily have been one of those test exercises. So, start by applying the rules you've been taught. First, find the paradox. Second, reduce it to its simplest terms. Third, formulate your equation. Benny thought about it, leaning over the rail, brow furrowed. Esmeralda licked the side of his hand and started eating his shirt cuff. He didn't notice. One of the rules he'd committed to memory, Friday night at the Working Men's Institute, and it was always freezing cold because they were too tight to turn on the heating until December, was that a small anomaly usually has big causes. Look, therefore, to the wider picture. Of course, Cassie wasn't really in a position to supply reliable data, but suppose, just for argument's sake, that the bloke, the wimp, the waste of space, was exhibiting the same symptoms. In which case, you'd have two people acting like they're in love, but they aren't. A small candle flickered in Benny's mind, and he rummaged in his inside pocket for a pen and something to write on. A equals B, but doesn't equal C. D equals E, but not F. Therefore, X, why does it always have to be X, represents the... He scribbled for a minute or so, until the paying-in slip he'd been using was almost full of tiny squiggly letters and symbols... Let X, let it be what? Whisper words of wisdom. Let it be, ah. The trouble was, back in the Working Men's Institute, you always had to show you're working or you got no marks, even if the answer was the right one. He'd always bitterly resented that. It seemed arbitrary and unfair. Take Danny Earnshaw. Nearly always got the wrong answer. Nearly always got top marks. Benny, on the other hand, Got the right answer 99 times out of 100. But they put him back a year for lack of progress. Bloody Earnshaw. Whatever had become of him, Benny wondered. Could do with him here right now because Benny knew the answer or something very like it. But he had no idea how he'd got there. Which was a bloody shame since he couldn't very well go to young Cassie and tell her what was going on. And then say, don't ask, I just know. He sighed and noticed he was missing three quarters of his left shirt cuff. The answer was, not two people in love, but four. The phone rang. Benny raised an eyebrow because last time he'd looked there hadn't been a phone down here in the cellar. He listened, located the source of the noise and picked it up. There you are, Rosie Tanner. I've been turning the place upside down looking for you. Benny sighed. Tell them to reschedule it for early next week, before half ten, for Joyce. I haven't got a clue what you're on about, Rosie replied. She used her own voice when she talked to him. Flattering, in a way. But a pity. You've got a client waiting in reception. Been there quarter an hour, and he's not pleased. Can't be. It wasn't anything in my diary. It's a new job. 
emergency. They always say that. This time it's true. Apparently, a Balrog's just moved into the Burnside nuclear plant and they want it shifted. Goblin chuckle. You get all the rotten jobs. Yes, Benny growled and hung up. Burnside, he thought. That's in bloody Scotland. Well, someone else will have to do the banking, that's all. He gave Esmeralda her second apple, pulled his jacket sleeve down over the tatters of his cuff and headed for the stairs. Four, he thought. A crowd. Must remember to talk to young Cassie as soon as I get back. Out onto the landing, through the computer room, down one flight of the back stairs, across the lower landing, once upon a time they tried calling it the mezzanine, but the effort of trying to keep straight faces had interfered with work, so they had abandoned that. Down one flight of the middle stairs, on down the corridor, through the fire door and into the front office. I'll be out for the rest of the day, he told Mr Tanner's mum. She gave him a sympathetic look. Scotland, she asked. Yes. Have fun. A Balrog in a nuclear reactor. I'll try, Benny said, and stepped into the revolving door. It wasn't what I thought it was. It wasn't what I thought it was. Does lie to yourself make you go blind? It wasn't what I thought it was. It can't have been. Colin opened his eyes. The first thing he saw was the underside of his bed. Ah, yes, he said to himself. I remember now. I came down here because I was scared in case a demon came back. Not a demon. Not what I thought it was. The room was full of daylight and he was still wearing the claws he'd had on yesterday. He wriggled sideways until he could stand up. The face in the mirror looked even dorsier than usual. He'd shaved its chin. But that didn't help a great deal. Time to go downstairs for breakfast. Dad wasn't there. He'd gone in early. Mum told him as she confronted him with a huge bowl full of porridge. It was ten years since he'd first explained to her that porridge gave him raging indigestion. He ate it alone and in silence, then went to work. Morning, he called out as he passed the front desk. It was pure habit, a Pavlovian reaction. Each morning for the last eight years he'd called out this insincere greeting and Pam on the front desk had echoed it. He knew what Pam looked like, so there's no point wasting a neck swivel just to see her. He cocked his wrist to push open the connecting door. Hi, said the receptionist. You must be calling Hollingshead. He stopped and turned his head. Uh, Hello, he said. Uh, Who? She smiled at him. I'm the new receptionist, she said. Compare and contrast. It made two recent visits to the office of J.W. Wells. In the city. On both occasions, there had been a, why mince words, stunningly lovely girl behind the front desk. The first time, he'd experienced that numbed, having just walked through a plate glass door feeling that besets susceptible young men when it confronted with extreme beauty. The second time, he'd been too preoccupied to care, but he'd still been human enough to notice. The young female sitting where Pam usually sat wasn't in the CM League. Nice looking, on balance, though maybe a smidge on the chunky side. On the other hand, right, he said. You're. Pam's on holiday, she explained. I'm filling in for her. Actually, I'm her niece. Colin relaxed slightly. Uh, Pleased to meet you, he said. Uh, What's your name? She frowned. Ah, she said. Uh, That's a funny name. Uh, Is it short for? No, that's not what I'm called. Her frown deepened. Oh, well, I suppose I'd better tell you and get it over with. Um, I'm called Famine. Colin thought for a moment. That's uh, Spanish, isn't it? She winced slightly. No, she said. English. Uh, my two sisters are called Pestilence and War. And my kid brother, she sighed. My dad's quite religious, you see. Uh, you can laugh now if you want to. Colin frowned. I uh, don't think that's funny, he said. It must be uh, really difficult for you. <laughs> She shrugged. You get used to it, she said. And it's sort of a family tradition, like Dad's first name is Envy and he's got six brothers and sisters. Bit of a pain, really. Uh, Sounds like it, Colin said. Have you got a middle name? You could use that instead. She shook her head. Not really, she said. For my middle name, 
They called me after Dad's sister. I'm Famine L. Williams. She shrugged again. Could have been worse, she said. I heard on the radio once about some family in America that called their kids after Santa's reindeer. Colin pursed his lips. That'd be worse. Or there's the Seven Dwarves, she added. Or the 1966 England World Cup squad. Mostly people call me Fam, for short. I'll do that then, Colin said. Then he grinned. My dad's in that case too, he said. Pam seemed to hesitate for a moment. Then she grinned. That's what Auntie Pam told me, she said. She's your mum's sister, right? That's right, yes. How did I guess? <laughs> she smiled at him. Well, anyway, she said, and hesitated. I'd uh, better get on, I suppose, <laughs> he said. Though of course he had nothing useful to do, and all day to fill with doing it. See you around then. See you, <laughs> Colin shoved through the connecting door and potted down to his office, just in case some splendid task or quest was waiting on his desk. Ha! Ah, no such luck. So he sat down. He remembered. My dad in league with the devil. <laughs> and last night I saw... Uh, and this morning. I forgot all about it while I was chatting to some girl on reception. <laughs> Eek! <laughs> What's that make me? Normal? He considered the interpretation and rejected it. No, <laughs> he was a callous, shallow, thoughtless bastard. How could any decent human being possibly allow themselves to be sidetracked by a nice-looking girl when his universe was in tatters and his own father was in mortal peril? <laughs> no, mm, immortal peril, which was far, far worse. Nice-looking? Well, yes. Also bright, cheerful, easy to get along with, nice sense of humour. There is no thunk as the arrow strikes home. Presumably Cupid uses a silencer, as befits a sniper. Instead, there's a slight jolt. The subconscious mind registers a change that slightly affects everything. It's like playing with the TV remote. You turn the colour down to black and white, then gradually bring it back up again. That moment, when the shades of grey start to blush in the first faint colours, is pretty much what it's like. Oh, you say to yourself as you acknowledge the fact for the first time. Right. From there on, it gathers pierce, but there's a moment, like the short interval of time when you realise you've caught a cold, when the symptoms are still only slight. But the diagnosis is certain. Whether you then proceed to extremes of daydreaming, mooning about, making a fool and a nuisance of yourself depends on the severity of the case and your own nature. The start, however, is always the same. Well then, Colin thought. Next he scowled at a blank spot on the wall, because it couldn't have come at a more inconvenient time if it had tried. How often had he laughed in an infuriated scorn at the movies, when the hero and heroine discover their true feelings for each other in the middle of a gun battle car chase earthquake, alien invasion, or, if it's a Bond film, all of the above simultaneously, because surely you'd be far too preoccupied with blind terror and stuff like that. Apparently not. The world was breaking up all around him. Bloody great big chunks of sky were falling down on him like Newton's apple. But that didn't matter. He was still in the firing line for a fly-by shooting. Maybe that was the rule rather than the exception. Maybe true love always comes at the most inconvenient moment, like phone calls from your mother or jury service. Maybe that's how you're supposed to know that this one's the... Colin opened his eyes wide and sat up. Miss Wright. Apparently his subconscious mind thought so, or it wouldn't be flailing around concepts like true love. Really, though? It barely said two words to Fam, and already he was holding a lighted match over a gunpowder trail that led directly to mortgages, soft furnishings, kiddie seats in the car, Sunday mornings at the DIY superstore, family holidays, thinking seriously about pensions, school league tables, and Christmas round robins filled with graduating offspring and minor geriatric ailments. When you're about to die, your whole past life's supposed to flash before your eyes. When you fall in true love, on the other hand, what you see in the twinkling of an eye is your entire future. It's very much a matter of opinion, which is the more depressing. <laughs> Even so, Colin thought. So what? He thought of a father-in-law called Envy, and a brother-in-law who, if he opted for a career as a professional darts player, would be seen standing at the hockey with Death Williams, 
spread eagled in big white letters across his shoulder blades, and against that balanced the memory of a smile. No big deal. In fact, the utter unspeakableness of their families was something they had in common, which would undoubtedly draw them closer together. He gave up. Resistance is futile. Likewise, logic, common sense and the instinctive urge to self-preservation. He glanced at his watch. Ten minutes since he'd come in through the front office door. Might as well amble back to reception and see if there were any messages for him. <laughs> Usually... Colin slouched along the corridor, though sometimes he dawdled and occasionally he traipsed. This time he practically sprinted. His head was full of sleigh bells and birdsong, which was probably why he almost failed to notice something unusual standing in the middle of the small room just in front of the fire door, where they kept the photocopier, the shredder and three battered old green filing cabinets. Almost, but not quite. He stopped, looked at it and wilted it like an action man inadvertently microwaved. It was much smaller than the one at home, hardly more than a sapling. Finally, as a last resort, Connie tried Levinson and Depina on temporal displacement. She hadn't bothered looking there before, partly because she was sure it was really something quite simple and straightforward, partly because her copy of Levinson was on the top shelf and she'd have to stand on a chair to reach it. She stepped back down and blew dust off the top of the book. It fell open at the flyleaf. Constance Schwartz Alperich, St Bartold's College, Nuneaton. She frowned. She'd written that in the same year that the Beatles had recorded Eleanor Rigby. <laughs> maybe she was getting too old for this nonsense. Or maybe not. She sat down and turned to the index. Cassie's problem had chafed at her mind ever since the poor girl had explained it to her in the pub, and the irritation was getting in the way of her work. Better to get it sorted out once and for all, and then she'd be able to concentrate on doing what she was paid for. Anomalies. 3, 7, 13, 67, 69, 72, 86, 92, F, 103. There were some aspects of the matter that definitely rang bells, to the point where, if Connie closed her eyes, she could practically see Quasimodo swinging to and fro underneath them. The difficulty was they had nothing to do with the particulars of this case. They were out of place, like a torpedo in a salad. Nothing on page 13. She flipped to the end of the book. Twenty years ago, she felt sure she would have been able to put her finger on it straight away. No missing. It was just a matter of seeing the big picture. Knock, knock. The door opened and Cassie came in. With a sigh, Connie put the book down. I was just thinking about you, she said. Oh, this bloody thing of yours, it's really starting to bug me. Me too, Cassie said. But that's not why I'm here. I was wondering, could you just cast your eye over this clause here? I think it means what I want it to mean. But I've been staring at it for so long it could mean practically anything. Connie grinned. Give it here, she said. She read it quickly and nodded. Seems perfectly clear to me, she said. Ah, right. Thanks. Roughly paraphrased. It means we've caught you by the balls, but deep down we're philanthropists, so we're bunged in this huge great loophole so you can scamper away like frightened woodland creatures and there's bugger all that we'll be able to do about it. Was that what you wanted it to say? Oh, Cassie sat down. It's no good, she said. It's really starting to get to me. I know. Connie picked up a pen, crossed out some words in the offending paragraph, and wrote some bits in over the top. Try that, she said. Better? Yes, much, I guess. Oh, I don't know. Is it all right or not? Search me. I can't concentrate either. A bloody menace, that's what you are. Sorry. Unlike you, Connie went on. I'm trying to do something about it. Or I was before you barged in. She swiveled the book around so that Cassie could see the title on the spine. Temporal displacement, Cassie said. What's that got to do with anything? I don't know, Connie admitted. But I've tried everything sensible I could think of. So I thought I'd waste my time on something that it couldn't possibly be. Cassie nodded. I can see the logic in that, she said. Any luck? No, <laughs> but like I said, I'd only just started. 
Come back in half an hour, when I've failed properly. <laughs> Cassie stood up. It's very kind of you to go to all this trouble, she said. Maybe it's only a load of coincidences, or I'm imagining things, or... Shut up, Connie said. Here, what about this? Poor Six Ghost. Did you do that at college? Cassie frowned. It does sound vaguely familiar, she said. What's it all about? Well, Connie said, but the phone rang. She picked it up, listened, grunted and put it down. Here, she said, pushing the book across the desk. You'll have to read it for yourself. Apparently, I've been summoned. Summoned? By them. God only knows why, but there's only one way to find out. You read that bit there, and I'll explain what I'm on about when I get back. So, Cassie picked up the book. Connie had marked the place with an empty after it wrapper. Is generally misinterpreted as a reference to Leo Porzig, late Fulbright Professor of Applied Metaphysics at Stanford University. In fact, Porzig was not the first to identify the phenomenon. However, it was his landmark article in Metapsychosis 67, 1962, that initially drew attention to the research conducted in Paris by Lemon and Diakonoff between 1927 and 1932. Cassie frowned. Skip all that. His epoch-making 1962 article poorly characterises the effect thus. An individual A of sound mind and subject to no perceptible supernatural influence becomes aware that he is in fact leading the life of another individual B. He has some or all of B's memories, finds himself in situations alien to his own circumstances but relevant to B's experiences emotions or holds opinions entirely foreign to his own nature but in keeping with bees in some cases reported by lemon and diakonov at the relevant time b had predeceased a sometimes a substantial number of years whereas in other instances a and b were almost exact contemporaries and b was still alive under the influence of the syndrome subjects had espoused causes they detested quarrel bitterly with close friends and family, and in some instances married partners they heartily disliked. Lemon and Dirkinov collated the data, but were unable to advance any cogent explanation. It was Porzig who proposed the hypothesis that the effect is a symptom of a temporal anomaly, in essence a massive rupture in the time-causality interface, whereby B, having been preordained to commit some act or suffer some experience, but having been prevented by the intervention of some unforeseen and anomalous external force or event, B's destiny attaches itself to A and influences his existence in all relevant aspects as though A were indeed B. Hmm. Cassie looked up and rubbed her eyelids. It wasn't quite as bad as tax statutes or EU directives, but it wasn't exactly light holiday reading either. She went back and had another crack at it. Second time around wasn't much better than the first. Third time, a glimmer of light began to shine through the cracks. She cast her mind back to college when she'd had to weird through this sort of garbage all the time. Back then, it always helped if she stuck in a few names. So she did that and went through it in her mind to see if it made any sense. All right. Suppose Sean Connery's got a destiny... He's destined to be the first man on Mars, but the day before the Mars rocket is due to blast off from Canaveral, Sean trips over the cat, falls down the stairs and sprains his ankle. Destiny is foiled, but what's written is written. So instead, Destiny darts out into the street and press gangs the first remotely suitable person it comes across. Jim Carrey, say, into taking Sean's place. Accordingly, Jim abandons his promising career in insurance, signs up with NASA and becomes an astronaut. Destiny is happy because, in the end, a human toe leaves a print on the chartreuse dust of an alien world. Whether Jim likes it or not, it's neither here nor there. Fine. Back to the book. Complications arise when the superimposition of B's destiny on A prevents A from fulfilling his own destiny, which in turn lights on a random third party, C, and so on in a rapidly escalating chain reaction. That no such sequence of events has yet been detected or recorded, Porzig argued, is beside the point. Given the right circumstances, such a chain reaction could quite possibly develop with obviously disastrous consequences. 
dismissing Porzig as unduly alarmist and seeking to refute his basic conclusions, Frosny and Crossland, JTS 105, 1972, pages 156 to 94, argued that such an effect would immediately be neutralised and readjusted by Malik's phenomenon, and accordingly, Cassie shut the book. She couldn't be asked with Throsny and Crossland right now. In fact, if they both fell down an open manhole cover and Mirluck tumbled in after them and broke his stupid neck, it served them all right for complicating her life to the point where she wanted to scream. Living someone else's life instead of my own, she thought. Well, in a sense, she'd been doing that for years. Daddy's voice. You don't want to be a boring old accountant, kitten. You're going to be a sorcerer, just like me. But that wasn't an effect or a phenomenon. That was her own fault for not digging her heels in and saying, No. The recent stuff, though, that was something else. Suppose, then, that somebody she didn't know, hadn't ever met, had been destined since time began to fall in love with Colling Hollingshead. A nasty thought, that. Although it was always possible that this unknown person had been very naughty in a previous existence. Suppose, though, and suppose somewhere along the line true love had cast a shoe or blown a tyre, and suppose that, in consequence, there was this huge splodge of romance ricocheting around like a stray bullet, and she just happened to be in the way. Eek, Cassie thought. Or maybe it happens all the time, which would at least go some way towards explaining some of the bizarre combinations you see wheeling trolleys around home base together on bank holidays. <laughs> Very nasty thought. But it was all going to be all right in the end, because that nice Mr. Porzig, or one of his fellow researchers, would undoubtedly have come up with an antidote or cure, something you could get from boots and your lunch hour and gobble down, and everything's fine again. Cassie grabbed for the book and flicked through to Connie's bookmark. Drivel, drivel, drivel. Ah, here we go. As regards counteracting an existing anomaly or circumventing one belief likely to occur, at the time of writing there is a general consensus among the leading authorities, even Falkenstein and Shah, the leading proponents of the revisionist approach, agree that once the syndrome has taken effect, absolutely nothing can be done to set things right. Cassie closed the book and dumped it on the desk. Thank you ever so bloody much, she thought. Of course, she didn't believe a word of it. It was all just a bunch of stupid academics making up the most appalling garbage simply so they could justify their research grants. And even if it wasn't, there was bound to be some other perfectly rational explanation for what was happening to her, which was really no big deal in any case. Hardly worth sparing a moment's thought for. She thought about hurling the book on the floor and jumping on it, which wouldn't solve much, but might soothe her immediate need for self-expression. But it was Connie's book. It was ridiculous, though. That'd be something she could do instead of dropping a meek curtsy and trooping off to choose a wedding dress. To hell with it. It was bullying, and she wouldn't stand for it. You're still here? Connie had come back. Cassie was about to tell her all about Porzig and the stars in their courses and everything when she caught sight of the look on Connie's face. Something's up, she said. Connie nodded and sat down. You could say that, she said. Something bad. Oh, I don't know, Connie shrugged. Define bad. If you mean something really shitty and unfair, then yes, something bad, she sighed and leaned back in her chair. Guess what? she said. The bastards have given me the sack. Thank you so much for listening to chapter 7 of You Don't Have to Be Evil to Work Here, but it helps. Chapter 8 will be published in a couple of days, all being well. Um, if you want to leave a comment, let me know how you're doing. You're more than welcome. I always try and reply. Um, if you can, click that notifications bell, hit the like button, share, subscribe if you want to. I know it's a pain for me to keep saying it all the time, but it really, really does help and lets me know this is all worthwhile. Um, I love, love, love bringing these audiobooks to you. So any feedback is always good feedback. Anywho, I'll stop whiffling on now and I'll see you in a couple of days, petals. Thanks for listening. Take it easy.